This is a rock from Rishikesh, India, and it comes from the Ganges. All stones hold memory. So this rock holds the memory of the Ganges. It holds the memory of the water. It's been shaped by the water. It's been smoothed by the river. And the Ganges is a holy river. Many prayers and mantras have been sung along the Ganges for centuries. Who knows how many songs and mantras and holy words this rock has heard. So at this moment, perhaps this stone will remember this brief blip of an instant from when a singing woman held it in her hand before it got passed to somebody else's hand. How many hands has this rock been inside? And what wisdom does this stone have that we need now in our lives? We've just entered inside a rock, or at least my own sound response to that rock. And one of the things about sacred sites is that most of them are made of stone. So here we have stones in Stonehenge, the blue stones from the mountains in Wales that carry a certain wild energy that were needed for that place. Or we have the stones in Charter Cathedral. Who knows what quarry they came from, how old those stones are. Some of the stones in the columns of cathedrals in England have tiny millions and millions of tiny little seashells in them, microscopic seashells, or stones with crystalline ma matrices in them. Many of the stones in Avebury have crystalline matrix in that stone, or the stones in, of pink granite in the King's Chamber, or the red granite altar in Philae in Egypt and the Isis altar. Those stones have all been recognized as stones that have particular qualities. And I believe sacred sites were built with acoustics in mind. I've been on a 10-year journey writing a book called Sacred Space, Sacred Sound, The Acoustic Mysteries of Holy Places. And that's one of the things that I found out on that journey is how I believe early people knew the natural resonance, experienced the natural resonance through hearing the echo of their own voices and then built in mind, with acoustics in mind so that the voice that's sent out in prayer could be echoed back so that there's the sense that Spirit's hearing you and answering your call, your prayer. Your voice is, is now more than your voice because of the resonance of the space. So I said, could you ask the guide if I could stay there alone, if I could come back? to sing longer. And they said, yes, will you allow us to accompany you? And I said, yes. So about an hour later, the three of us went back, and we were in the crypt alone. I looked at the Black Madonna in the crypt, and I began to sing to her, and I began to sing Alleluia. And I began to walk very slowly towards her, and just as I was at a certain point, all the lights went out. And these tiny little rose-colored lights lined the carpet. So then I sat and I asked the Black Madonna if it had another message for me. And the message I received was, Do you know how tiny you are? You can't even begin to imagine how vast this place is and all that's contained here. And you can't even begin to comprehend 
All that I know is the Black Madonna, all that I've seen, witnessed. Do you know how small you are? You're just a small part of this. But then she said, do you know how big you are? Do you know how important it is that you sing? Do you know what you carry inside of you through your voice? And I felt in that moment this juxtaposition of being tinier than an atom inside of a sand grain and bigger than the cosmos here in this body, in this five foot two body. I had that experience of stretching through time in both directions, being so small and so huge. And I feel that that message that she gave me is really the message we're all wanting. Do you know how special you are? We each need to hear that in our own way. We each need to be acknowledged for the gift that is our particular gift, our unique offering, our individualized vibration, because there's only one of me. Who knows how long I'll live? There's one of me. Here's my vibration right now coming out. But then there's your vibration. There's all the other vibrations that are each special, each unique, each need to be heard, each with a mission, each need to give their gift. Whenever I'm at a place in nature or in a sacred spot like a cathedral or a cave, the first thing that I do is listen. What is it that I'm hearing? What is my sound response to this space? And sometimes I need to go through a process of letting go of all of the things that are occupying my mind, all of the things that are my civilized mind. I need to go through a process of letting go of those things so that I can really come into the space and be silent. And to meet that space in the same way that I might meet a person. First you need to listen, you need to have a sense of who that person is and what that dialogue needs to be. So listening to a spot in nature here in Sedona in the Red Rocks is very different than listening into an interior space of a cathedral where a Gregorian chant might be sung. Here I'm listening to the sound of the crows that are flying overhead. I'm listening to the sound of the wind. I'm listening also to the mineral language of the earth that's speaking through the rocks. And for a moment, something happens where I feel like I've become the rock and I'm giving it a voice. Or I'm telling the rock through my breath, through my sound, a little bit of how I feel when I'm in its presence. As I sang on the rock, I was feeling the sun stream down into me. And there was a moment where it was a communication with the sunlight, with the rays of sunlight, and the language of sunlight that indigenous people all over the earth have always honored and sung to. Some cultures feel that the sun won't rise up unless we sing to it. Sometimes we forget that we're a voice for the earth and that we have a responsibility to sing and to give our breath as nourishment to this place. 